hello, check, check. Hey guys, how are you doing today? You happy it's almost over or sad it's almost over? <laughs> I am, uh, I'm grateful to be here today. Um, I have two challenges today. Number one is typically it takes me seven days uh, during a immersion experience for 12 hours a day minimum to create as much context as I have to create in about 18 minutes for you today. And the second thing is, is I have to explain something that is extremely misunderstood on an individual and a cultural level, which is the topic of emotional trauma. So what we're going to talk about today is how can we possibly harness all of our differences? And in the world, in the state of the world that we're in today, um, there's a lot of polarity. There's a lot of um, us versus them mindset. And I'm the person that people come to to answer very difficult questions. And so hopefully today, if I could do my job right in the short period of time that I have, I can help really open up a conversation. And to just lead with the elephant in the room, I'm probably the least likely person to be giving a conversation or having a talk like this because I'm a six foot five white guy from Kansas I grew up in the upper middle class, and I'm a college dropout with no formal education, and I'm going to be talking to you about leading edge mental health ideas. And now one thing is I dropped out of college to pursue my dream job, not because I flunked out. But typically in the field that I tend to operate in, a PhD, LCSW, LIC, PC, the alphabet after your name is what's required to have a conversation. And what I do have though is over 10,000 hours uh, working with clients one-on-one. -on -one. And so I have an evidence-based approach and I'm mostly a coach is what I do, but I've had to turn what I do into a business. And so the th thing that I think really qualifies me to be here and to really share what I've learned over the last decade doing this work is my evidence-based approach with the actual clients we've worked with and the fact that if our processes don't work, then the business fails. And so everything that we do has to be functional. In fact, I create a type of coaching called functional life coaching. And functional life coaching is the only trauma-informed and attachment-informed type of coaching in the world. And what that means is we take an evidence-based approach to understand what happened in your past that's creating the context of how you're behaving today that's preventing you from moving forward. So the general public tends to perceive coaching as people who help you move forward and therapy as people who help you look backwards. And functional coaching is a conversation that is really a uh, part of both of those things and, and help you move forward in context. So, my intention today is not to solve everything. My intention today is open up a conversation that I think will at least have you more curious about what emotional trauma is, how it's impacting your life, and if I can do my job well enough to be able to perceive what's happening out there in a much different way. So is that cool? Okay, cool. Just making sure because we got 15 minutes to create a brand new context for you. So Growing up, I was raised by two scientists, and they trained me to ask the single most annoying question a child can ask. Yeah, why? And it usually bottomed out at, because I said so, or because I'm your father, or because I'm your mother. No one ever said, well, because I have childhood unresolved trauma that doesn't, is coming up for me right now, and I don't want to deal with you because you're stressing me out. No one ever said that, right? And so it kind of bottomed out at, you know, because I said so. And that was never really satisfying for me. And the thing is, is that I never stopped asking that question. And as I've gotten into the work that I do, that's basically the only question I've ever asked any of our clients, which is why? You said that you wanted to stand your meal plan, why didn't you? You said you wanted to break up with your boyfriend, why didn't you? You said you wanted to earn more money, how come? And over a long enough period of time, if you really ask the question why, you get some very interesting answers. And so my approach with everything because I was, uh, you know, a, my father's a PhD in biology, my mother's a master's. I grew up in the scientific process of testing a hypothesis and seeing what happens. Everything I do is a systems approach. And my mindset is always about what's the root cause of something? Because the problem is never the problem. The problem that we most of us have in our lives is a symptom. And what's happening today, we're really only having a conversation around a symptom level conversation. So we have to go deeper. And Toyota, uh, the founder of Toyota is the person who brought forward this idea of asking why. So when I found this guy, I was like, see, I knew earlier that there was something in, like, I knew back when I was a kid, it was like a very validating, cathartic experience. Because what Toyota teaches us is you got to ask why about five times to get down to the root cause. And typically this might be for a manufacturing process or a business process, but I started asking questions like this. Because my clients started asking me this question and I had to come up with answers. Why are they red? Why are they blue? Why are we so polarized today? Why are we seeing, you know, covers like this? More red, more blue. It's about to get worse. Why? And not just at a symptom level, but at a root cause level. Why are we seeing headlines like this where we're more divided than ever when the literal word united is in the title and the name of our country? 
Why is that division happening? Why is all this pessimism happening? And why is everyone talking about the possibility of another civil war? People, my clients come to me for questions like this and I have to answer it. And then I get questions like this, why? And I have to answer it in a way that is actually accurate, not biased, because as a coach and someone who's focused on the root cause, it's not about a certain side. It's about understanding what's really there. And so why this conversation is so difficult is because it's so emotionally charged, but to understand something, you have to be able to go deeper than surface level. And to change something, you really got to understand the root cause. And so the thing is, when you look at what's happening in the world today and the polarization that's happening today and the hate and the anger and the unfriending, right? All these things that's happening, if you really think about our wisdom traditions and where we've come from and who we say we follow and who, what we say we believe, our whole wisdom traditions are just so full of the best information that we should by now be following. In the you know, uh, Old Testament, Leviticus says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your kinfolk. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is Old Testament. This is not new information. We can pop on over to the Talmud, the exact same thing. What is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the whole thing. Everything else is details. And yet, for some reason, we're more divided than ever. And then, of course, we have Seneca who says, treat your inferior as you would wish your superior to treat you. So this wisdom of this golden rule idea has been around forever. And obviously, you know, we obviously know the great commandment that Jesus taught us. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. So if this has been around forever, for thousands and thousands of years, and we've all read the books, or say we did, and we've all had the philosophies and we've been raised in it, then why are we here today? And why are we so polarized? And that's the question that I've been asking for a long time. I've had to address with our clients. And this is the answer. John Bowlby was an incredible man. He was a child psychiatrist in World War II, and he brought forward the idea of what's called attachment theory, or how we form emotional and psychological bonds. And what Bowlby discovered is that we do as we have been done by. So when you look at something like the golden rule, do unto others as you would want them to do unto you, and all you know is pain, then how will you do unto others? All you'll do to them is pain. And so attachment theory helps us understand that the expectancy of how we treat other people, the expectancy of how they treat us is formed by our early childhood bonds. And so the only thing we know how to do is what's been done to us. And so that is the beginning of the conversation that we have to start to have when we talk about what is the true root cause of what's happening today. Now I can't dive into this because I wrote a whole book on it, but what I can tell you is when you ask why five times and you work with enough people, this is what I found. Why do they behave like that? Pick any behavior in the world you want to change. It could be drinking wine too late at night. It could be racism. It could be hatred. It doesn't matter. Pick any behavior. And the behavior is motivated by a thought that they're thinking. But that's not enough. Change your thoughts, change your life is really difficult because there's affect, there's information coming up from the body, emotional information that's causing all these thoughts. So if you go, why are they having these thoughts? It's because there's emotional data that's coming up. And most emotional data, especially in the presence of a threat, is so automatic that it happens before your nervous system and your, certainly your prefrontal cortex of the brain can catch it. And what produces those emotions are beliefs and the thing about beliefs are, beliefs are not just of the mind. Neural expectancy is the expectation of your entire nervous system for what does this mean? Because our bodies are threat detecting machines. So not just does our brain, but our entire nervous system has a neural expectancy or belief about what something means. So that when you see something, immediately you're asking yourself, not on a conscious level, but your whole body is deciding what does this mean? And that belief, that body belief, comes from the quality of the attachment relationship and the bonds that we form primarily early in childhood. And so when you have an emotionally traumatic event, when you ask the question, why does someone grow and why does someone not grow, you have to look at these different layers. And so what this means is, is that we all have had different attachment uh, opportunities. We grew up in different environments. And so we can't just say, change your thoughts, change your life. We can't just say they're wrong or I'm right. We have to go deeper to ask why do they feel that way in the first place? And so the real root cause of what's happening today is systemic, unidentified, unhealed, and unresolved emotional trauma. And this is probably one of the most misunderstood topics in the world because most people don't even know they have it. If you talk to most, person, most people, they would say, I don't have trauma. And the reason why is because Trauma is thought of as something that's a physical injury. But Bowlby defines trauma as any event that seriously threatens the attachment relationship 
And so if that's a little too sciencey, think of it this way. Emotional trauma is any rupture of a physical, psychological, or emotional safety. So when you don't feel safe, when you feel anxiety, when there's a threat in front of you, that's a traumatizing event. And how well you recover from that event is based on how well, uh, how your level of your attachment, how secure you are, how secure you are and safe in the relationships that you have in your life. And so because of this, m emotional trauma is so misunderstood because most people say, oh, there's no trauma there, there was no physical injury. But the problem with emotional trauma is it's invisible because you can't see it. It's, it's, in, it's, a, it's an internal cut, if you will, that's hard to see. And so the thing about trauma is it can be acute, meaning in the moment, or chronic, meaning it's going on for a long period of time. And so here are some symptoms of emotional trauma. And I'm curious if you see any up there that might resonate with you or someone you know. We have anxiety, depression, insomnia, shame, anger, fear, hypervigilance, perfectionism, procrastination, lack of empathy or bullying, impaired capacity to protect yourself, imposter syndrome, self-doubt, feeling worthless, self-harm, suicidal ideation, pretty much every personality disorder in the world. All of the data is showing that these are all symptoms of emotional trauma. So as someone who dwells in the realm of trauma, when I look out into the world today, I see something very different than red and blue. I see hurt is what I see. And we have examples of acute traumatic experiences. So these are in the moment things that happen. These are the standard things that most people think are traumatizing and anything outside of this isn't trauma. But we also have chronic traumatic experiences, whether it's chronic abuse, chronic emotional neglect, either intentionally or unintentionally. You can have a parent who's right there with you physically, but if they're not emotionally in tune with a child, that is actually emotional neglect. That is a separation of connection. Chronic illness, chronic pain, all the opioid epidemics, all the things that we're seeing are all symptoms of an underlying root cause that has not been talked about. So what you can start to see is, all of a sudden, the world is different than maybe you had thought before. And hopefully, in this short period of time, I'm at least starting to change the context with which you can see things. Now, these are some of the big ones. Chronic social traumatic experiences, racism, misogyny, xenophobia, sexism, classism, economic inequality, mass incarceration, and political polarization. These are all ongoing socially traumatizing experiences. And what's true is it's a human experience that's being had here in every single situation. And so what we have to start to realize is it's not about what's wrong with that person, it's what happened to that person. And when we have a conversation at that level, things start to shift and change. In fact, Oprah, when she, I saw her say this on 60 Minutes, I was like, okay, fine. I will double down on what I'm doing because I've been doing trauma work for 10 years and I thought I had to have a PhD just to say the word in public. And I decided after I heard Oprah say this, I said, you know what, I'm moving forward anyway. Oprah said recently, unless you fix the trauma that has caused people to be the way that they are, which literally changes the way their brains operate, okay, unless you fix that trauma, you're working on the wrong thing. It could be a policy issue, it could be an issue of religion, it could be an issue of is, you know, gay marriage good or bad. All of that is a surface level symptom. The real question is what's happening down below at the deeper levels. And so the thing that's important to understand about trauma is it's an equal opportunity destroyer. So trauma sees through skin, sees through political party, sees through uh, the preference of your religious background, all those different labels that we put ourselves, trauma transcends all those things. And the other thing that's really important to say is that in order to change a thing, you have to understand the thing, but it doesn't make it right. And so what this means is you have to view trauma not as an excuse, but it certainly is the explanation. So when you see people who are doing horrible things in the world, illegal things, things where you're like, how could someone do that to somebody? They should go to jail. So it's, we're not saying that if someone did something bad, that all of a sudden now they're the victim, we should just feel bad for them, because that's not the case. However, if we want to change the way things are going, we have to understand it at a deeper level. And the truth is, hurt people hurt people and they pass it on. And we deny it. And that's one of the worst problems that we have right now. And so when you start to understand what is the solution for healing trauma, he, trauma is healed through safe relationships. The problem is today in the polarizing world that we're in, there's actually less and less and less safety that's happening and less and less and less connection that's starting to happen. And so I want to present to you the three phases of trauma healing, and uh, this, there could be like multiple theses right, written on the, about this, <laughs> all right? But this could hopefully start to give you a vision for what could be possible if we can come together and have a deeper conversation. So the first phase is the phase that we're in right now, which is the den denial of emotional trauma. There have been a lot of things happening in the last few years where trauma comes up and it gets pushed down. Trauma comes up and it gets pushed down. Trauma comes up and it gets pushed down. 
to get out of this cycle that we're in, we have to start to acknowledge the emotional trauma that's happening out there, both on a personal level and on a group level when it comes to especially marginalized communities, 100%. Now, once you get to a place where we say, okay, this is what happened, this is the trauma that happened, and we acknowledge it, that can feel really good in a short period of time, and that is a heroic moment to get there on a personal level, but you can't stay there. You've got to be able to get beyond it at some point to transcend it to say, that's something that happened to me, not this is who I am, because nobody is only traumatized. That may have been something that happened to you, but there is something beyond that. But each phase has to be recognized. So what we're seeing in the world today is an evolution from phase one to phase two. And the faster we can acknowledge our own individual trauma, and we can acknowledge the trauma of others, the faster we're gonna get out of this mess. And I like to take a cue from the largest data set in the world, Mother Nature. Been around longer than any clinical trial. <laughs> All right, Mother Nature is the largest data set in the world, and what we learn from biology, because I'm a child of biologist, so it comes by me naturally, and I've heard this term my whole life, biodiversity, meaning in an ecosystem, in an area, in an environment, the more diverse something is, the stronger it is. The more diverse something is, the more productive it can be. Everybody wants to be productive, I would assume, right? Everyone wants to be strong and be able to withstand things. So these are things that we need. When we look at nature, sameness equals weakness, so if we're only around people who are just like us, that makes us weak. It's the ability to step into another perspective, a diverse perspective, that makes us strong. And uh, scientist Dr. Damien Carrington said this about biodiversity. Biodiversity represents the knowledge learned by evolving species over millions of years about how to survive through a very vast different types of environments. And so what this means is biodiversity lets us know, like, hey, guys, here's the playbook of how to win. Here's the playbook of how to be safe. Here's the playbook of how to survive. And what we have available for us today in what's happening in the world today is we have a diverse amount of traumatic experiences, but we also have a diverse amount of traumatic coping opportunities. And if we can start to have a conversation at a deeper level, not at a symptom level, but at a deeper level of what happened to you, oh my God, here's what happened to me. And that conversation doesn't negate each other's experiences, but we can actually empathize with each other. Things are gonna change because there is a tremendous amount of wisdom in the diversity of our wounding. Do I know what it's like to have someone uh, act racist towards me? I don't. I don't have that context. I couldn't possibly imagine what that would be like. I grew up with white privilege, right? But I have other coping mechanisms for things that happened to me because my mom was, and both my parents were suffering from uh, trauma. My father was in Vietnam as a medic for three years. He suffered some significant trauma. My mom was, uh, had a broken back. And so they were always focused on her, taking care of her. So I was left alone in isolation, not because they were wrong or bad, but because they were focused on her. And so I didn't have that emotional or physical presence. So I have coping strategies that are different. If we can understand each other's coping strategies, each other's context, we can start to change the world. So the question is then, if trauma is the problem, how do we heal? And I don't have all the answers because we're learning so much every single day. But I can start with this. If you focus on identifying and healing your own emotional trauma, you become what's called a transitional character. And this is the idea that I want to leave you with. Transitional characters are what we need today. Dr. Broderick, who died uh, recently, uh, defined the term. He says a transitional character is a person who, in a single generation, changes the entire course of a lineage, who somehow finds a way to metabolize the poison and refuses to pass it on to their children. They break the mold. Their contribution to humanity is to filter the destructiveness out of their own lineage so that generations uh, downstream will have a supportive foundation upon which to build productive lives. To be a transitional character is one of the greatest honors you could have in your lineage. You may be the first person in your lineage to go to college. You may be the first person in your lineage to start a business. And if you can be the first person in your lineage to be a transitional character, you will have made a, a significant contribution to the world. And so five steps to become a transitional character, and these are something that takes time to implement. But the first thing we have to do is we have to validate an experience. Whether it's true or not is not the point. We want to validate the emotional content of what someone's sharing with us and then empathize with that content. How does that feel? That must be really difficult to go through. The more we can validate and not deny trauma, 
the better things are going to go. Once we start to empathize, then we can really connect with somebody at a deeper level than the symptom level, and that gives us the opportunity to understand what's really wrong so that we can make amends. The antidote for perfectionism is the ability to repair. The antidote for any problem in the world that we have out there is the ability to actually get empathy and repair. And then once we do that, we understand the new boundaries and we can set new limits. So this is the process of becoming a transitional character, and I always recommend starting with yourself. Right? There's probably someone in your life you want to fix, perhaps. And you're like, don't start with them, start with you. <laughs> All right? So the next time you ask yourself, why is this happening, and you see someone on Facebook or on Instagram or on social media, and you see things in the world happening the way they are, it's not because we're becoming more divided. It's because we're coming, becoming more in tune with our pain. And some people have a lot more pain today than others. And so when I look at the question, why is it happening today, I believe it's because now is our time and our invitation to become transitional characters so that we can end the cycle of emotional trauma in this lifetime. Thank you guys so much.